Mani Napudni, Nadlu Tembandi, Nadlu Ghana, Yatanga de Kamdi. Uh, welcome everybody and I acknowledge that we're on traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pay my respects to Elders past and present and also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who may be with us today. Um, and I thank Jack Buckskin for the gift of language. Um, we in the city of Adelaide are very aware of uh, what's happening to the women in our city and around our city. Um, and in particular, uh, the effects of the last couple of years uh, with COVID um, and what that impact has been, particularly on older women, but, but even on younger women. Um, the, the cohort of women have been most affected by this because generally they are the ones that are part-time workers due to family responsibilities, and that might be children or it might be aged, aging parents. Um, it is most likely, in most cases, that it is the female that takes on those responsibilities. Um, I've worked alongside many of the care agencies and the service agencies. Um, the prevalence is really frightening to think that's what's happening at the moment. And the numbers that are falling into homelessness, uh, particularly in that cohort over 55, is, uh, is really frightening, um, particularly as you get to that part of your life. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the conversation today because um, if there's uh, any solutions that we can come up with, I'd love to hear them. Um, we work very closely on some of the other issues, uh, equality of course, and also domestic violence. My Deputy Lord Mayor is uh, Aman Abrahimzadeh, um, that I think most people know. He's been a tireless campaigner against domestic violence and has the Zara Foundation named after his mother, um, who was uh, killed in a domestic violence um, uh, assault. and. Um, and so it's something that has never left our agenda this term. Um, and I thank Armand for his work in that area. Um, he's constantly brought that back into us. We've made sure that we have lots of policy in place, lots of um, even leave provisions in place. Um, but more so, we've done additional training um, uh, around bystander. So just to make people understand what it is to be a bystander and how to actually not be a bystander if you see or are aware of any of these things happening. So that's probably the area that we've concentrated most. Um, as an organisation, we've got a very good gender balance, um, even right up to the fact that I have a female C uh, CEO. Um, um, but that has been hard won. won. Uh, a lot of women get to a certain level in their career and because of other duties um, and the time that it takes and the energy that it takes, um, they, will, they will opt to stay at that mid-level. Those that do continue have always got to juggle their time management, their other responsibilities. Uh, as a mother of three and having uh, seen both of my parents through their various um, uh, needs. Uh, they're no longer with us, unfortunately, but um, one with dementia and one with um, uh, emphysema, uh, very different roles and responsibilities for me and my sisters. And so, um, and again, it was the girls in the family that were, were looking after the parents. So um, I'm, I'm very aware of that. And uh, uh, it's sort of, we, you know, the sandwich generation still exists where you're, you're caught between your kids and your, and your elder elderly parents. So I'm sort of, I'm very keen to uh, work alongside organisations that uh, are looking to make sure that we are moving in the right direction uh, on uh, equality and also to make sure that we put things in place to protect women as they, as they age. First of all, just from the outset, I'd really like to acknowledge that um, we're making this film on Ghana land and pay my respect to Ghana elders past and present and to Ghana future leaders. And in making that acknowledgement, I wanted to wholeheartedly offer my gratitude to the many Aboriginal women leaders who generously share wisdom and culture and who are often tireless, fearless advocates over uh, years, over decades and over lifetimes about all of the issues that impact um, women in our community. So I wanted to, to make that acknowledgement and in making that acknowledgement and to get to your question about the various issues that women in South Australia face, I wanted to say that there is so much intersectionality um, 
often women who are uh, experiencing particular issues or who come from diverse cultural backgrounds or who are living with disability, living in poverty, um, experiencing mental ill health are often, um, of course, experiencing a deeply in interconnected range of issues. Um, I was just reflecting on that question and thinking that, you know, in it was only 120 eight years ago um, since South Australia, South Australian activist women fiercely and proudly fought to make South Australia the first place in the world where women could uh, both vote and stand for parliament. That was an incredible achievement um, that was won by that fierce cohort of activist women. Um, I often reflect, however, that we do have a lot to celebrate in that regard in South Australia in terms of the advancement of women. But I often say um, that our rights were hard won, but we are absolutely not done because women still experience um, in South Australia a gender pay gap of around 7.4%. Women continue to experience um, domestic, family and sexual violence at a much higher rate uh, than men do. Uh, women still are not equally represented in every aspect of uh, uh, public life and uh, there are many other issues that we contemplate here in South Australia. We know that gender inequality lies at the core of all of those issues. We know that women were disproportionately affected by COVID in terms of um, economic security, loss of income, and also in terms of an increase in violence. So here in South Australia, as is the case with other places in Australia, I think gender inequality continues to drive economic insecurity, economic inequality, and also um, the horrific prevalence of violence against women here in South Australia and sadly beyond. Um, those are two of the key areas that um, women here in South Australia face, but there are many, many others and there's certainly a much more detailed explanation of each of those that I'm sure we will get to as we um, have our conversation today. It's so lovely to be in company of um, these amazing women. Uh, my name is Sanjuk Tavazdev. I'm the Director of the Office for Women here in uh, the State Government of South Australia. This topic of, uh, of women as they age is absolutely critical in South Australia. Uh, one in five women, I think, are uh, over 50. And so it is something that is um, affecting more and more of us. So I'm really uh, looking forward to contributing to this conversation because it is such an important conversation for South Australian women. My name is Jane Muzzer and I'm the Chief Executive of COTA in South Australia. Uh, we're an older people's movement um, uh, standing up for the rights, interests and futures of older South Australians. And we have a particular interest in older women because uh, they have fared badly as we've aged. Um, the inequality comes home to roost as we age. The compounded effect of inequality comes home to roost as we age. And so older women uh, have experienced more disadvantage, financial disadvantage. And when we have a look at older women of particular, older women who um, have been migrants or refugees, older women who um, are First Nations older women, um, older women with disabilities, for example, we see that those intersectionalities have created a, a compounded disadvantage that we haven't addressed as a community. Older women have done the heavy lifting in terms of childcare, do the heavy lifting in terms of the care often of parents, um, and have paid the price, paid the economic price, uh, paid the housing prices we're increasingly finding. Um, and, you know, I think that have uh, paid a price of invisibility. We have settings, policy settings by and large, um, that are based on male careers, um, so superannuation balances are lower, uh, ownership of homes um, is at risk. Um, and, and I think, you know, where we need to get to is a point where older women are 
front and centre and as much part of the narrative about our community um, as every other uh, segment. My name's Chris Beasley. I'm an Emerita Professor uh, located in relation to the politics and international relations department, but also have strong links with gender studies. Generally, I was the founder of the Fagal Centre for Research on Gender and was it, uh, one of its co inaugural co-directors. And I guess it was be part of, partly because I felt that despite you know, friends of mine saying, oh, well, gender's not an issue anymore, don't need to worry about that, that's all solved. That is not true. And everybody in this room knows that's not true. So that's why I thought it was really important to develop our knowledges about women and older women particularly. I suppose one of the things that I, I guess it's very difficult to say uh, better than James just said it, I would say that uh, one of the difficult, while older women as a group are very different and it's hard to think about one lump of them that all experience exactly the same thing. I think that Jane has put her finger on the, a crucial element of talking about older women, which is that question of accentuated marginalisation, quadrupled, <laughs> uh, accumulated uh, difficulties, marginalisations, but also um, I would want to add some other things there, that uh, all old women have some experience of ageism, and of course other men do too, but there are specific forms of uh, effect in life in relation to older women. And I'll just mention two. One of those is that all older people tend to be regarded as sort of somehow bland, uninteresting, not a source of creativity in the community, as asexual, as kind of dull. And I'm here to say we're not dull, not at all. Um, and that there are two things that I would add in relation to that. One is the, uh, the research I guess I've been doing on older women and in relation to dating and uh, intimacy and sexuality, as in these things continue and indeed a great number of old women in interviews will say that they still are part of the community and still are interesting and worth attention and of some sexual interest as well. So there's that part and I guess I would add a comment there which is the tendency is to not see older women in particular as a source for social change. And one of the things that I would say about internet dating and amongst older women is that they show signs of novel developments, novel behaviours, and I won't go into all the details of those, but to say that they're not as policed in their gender roles often as younger women. And sometimes that means there are opportunities. But one of the things I would say is that many of the languages about um, invisibility and women's marginalisation is the tendency to use language, which indeed we have noted uh, here before, to talk about respect and dignity. Mm -hmm. now, I don't know about you, but I always get nervous when people start talking about respect and dignity, because it sounds to me like, oh, you poor old dears. Um, and I do want to say, you know, actually, everybody deserves respect and dignity. Everybody does. There's nothing new about that. But it's important, and I would rather have a language which is much more positive than that, and to recognise older women as a resource, because that's what I think they are under, underestimated in. And one element of that lack of, of not being seen as a resource in the community, which Jane already mentioned, is our lack of visibility in, in purely in uh, physical terms, art, um, other uh, creative possibilities. Older women are rarely on film, are rarely in our pictures around the room. One of the examples of that was when I became a professor, and professorship is pretty difficult to get to, if you're a woman still, um, I noticed that there were no pictures of women almost. I was walking around, I went, what is this lunch to, you know, go hurrah, you're a professor. And there were no pictures of women anywhere, even though obviously women have occupied uh, that place. And I said to the then uh, art uh, curator, where are the pictures women? She took me around, I think there were two out of 150 or something like that. And to me, that is a way of saying that the kind of failure to recognise them as a resource. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be part of this group. Uh, my name is Dr Pam Papadellis and I'm the Deputy Director of the Fagal Centre for Research on Gender. 
I also work in the Department of Sociology, Criminology and Gender Studies, and I run the, the um, Sociology and Gender Studies program, and I've been involved in the Gender Studies program for many, many years, hence my interest in the, the centre. So the Faye Gower Centre for Research on Gender, as Chris said, was established in 2009. We have, it's a, a university-wide centre with I believe um, well, well over 50 members across the university in all faculties of the university. And uh, what we do there is we encourage not only women, we encourage all scholars who research on gender and sexuality. And um, that's predominantly our members are women. So we are a unit that supports women's research and we support research on women, women and sexuality as well. And we run workshops, seminars, conferences to further that work. So um, I guess uh, my personal work and my interest on gender is I uh, do research on women and ageing, particularly migrant women in the community. And I was involved in a project, uh, still am involved in, in some of that project, looking at migrant women and ageing particularly around issues that uh, migrant women with non-English uh, speaking backgrounds face around um, isolation in ageing mm -hmm. because of their lack of connection to community due to language barriers. And generally, as we know, women outlive uh, men and usually their partners, so they're alone. They're reliant on, on children for in, in a company, for interpreting, for doctor's visits, for all sorts of manners of you know, support. And um, one of the things that I found in my research is that the people that they tend to rely on are also what we would consider older women, as um, the Lord Mayor was saying, in terms of um, that sandwich generation. So um, these women too face a lot of um, issues around raising children, looking after elderly parents, and um, you know, managing their own careers, and quite often that's what suffers. And uh, which is why, as we see, and we've mentioned before, women are, um, you know, age in poverty, and um, if their husbands should leave them, um, you know, could also end up homeless and particularly disadvantaged. I guess one of the things that we've already raised in some of the, uh, the things that people have talked about as being specific problems is that all older women, not by any means, uh, homogenous block and that some uh, women face considerably more difficulties than others and um, so it's not that just being an older woman is you know, a marginalising thing per se, it isn't necessarily, but there are accumulated marginalisations and we are certain when, when Pam talks about older migrant women, they do face very specific uh, problems that aren't shared by everyone and we've already talked to some extent about the situation of Indigenous women. Some of those Indigenous women face many difficulties, specifically in relation to poverty and connectedness, connectedness of poverty with a great many other issues. There's been a, uh, a substantial increase in homelessness in women, particularly older women, and, and as you said, it's, sometimes it's just because they find themselves um, through divorce or other things that they are suddenly without a roof over their heads. Um, I really got to know a lot of this through working with Catherine House. Catherine House is an organisation in Adelaide that looks after women. Um, a lot of the women that go there for refuge are victims of domestic violence, but often it's financial uh, controls as well. Um, and uh, it was, you know, my uh, privilege to do a lot of work with them and meet a lot of the women that came through um, there. And that whole journey that those women are on to regain their self-confidence, to try and find housing, to be back out in the world. And, uh, you know, we, the, the reality is that there is discrimination against women who are of an older age group. Um, you know, I, I have grey hair. There's an immediate judgment as to, you know, who I am or where I am in my, in my life's journey because I have a particular hair colour. Um, there's so many things that we're judged on uh, on a daily basis, but that certainly is one of them. I just want to respond to something Chris said actually around seeing ourselves or seeing women. Um, 
one thing, it doesn't sound very significant, but I think it's a lasting legacy that I was really proud of doing as Lord Mayor, is in our chamber, there was only one woman, which was Queen Elizabeth II. The walls are covered in portraits of men. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I did very early on in the piece is said, I want some women in the chamber. And we've commissioned portraits. So the first two are up, which uh, Wendy Chapman, who was the first female Lord Mayor of any capital city in Australia, so, and, and Adelaide. Um, Dame Roma Mitchell, who we all know was an extraordinary woman and the first governor, female governor of South Australia. Um, I've got Auntie Shirley Priestley. So you talk about Aboriginal women that have championed uh, for other women. So Auntie Shirley uh, will be joining the ranks as well as many other women that have contributed in the leadership role. And, and part of that was simply that we have so many people coming through that chamber and you are not seeing women in those positions of leadership and justice and equality, so um, which I think is just significance. And you do need to see, you do need to see, you can't, you know, talk about being invisible. In that chamber, women were completely invisible. And indeed, one of the, the things we know is that women, older women, run into this lookism. Mm -hmm. uh, and lookism is this, you know, the, the look of the moment isn't an older woman look. It's, a, it's at the bottom of the pile and in terms of public appeal. It's a, at the bottom of the pile in terms of media appeal. And so the invisibility is, is combined often with another image of older women, which is a mocking image or a pathetic image. So, so it's an image which is um, either way older women lose out on. And I, and I want to just say that a lifetime of discrimination, I think, as we're learning through racism and, and sexism, a lifetime of discrimination interacts with our own psyche and self-confidence. And uh, so often women are, are told, well, just get out there and just, you know, promote yourselves and, and, and uh, you know, go inside for your confidence, be resilient. And I think that's a pretty tough ask for a whole lot of women who um, have experienced a lifetime of discrimination that is still happening. Um, you know, to be told, you know, this is all on you now and you've got to pull yourself out of this and, and, and somehow do something about it. And, and that's why I think, you know, this is a public issue. This is not a personal issue. We can't ask women who've, as I've said, done the heavy lifting in a whole lot of ways already to then uh, be responsible for addressing the ongoing discrimination and inequality. And I would agree with that in, in that um, we do have this push in our society, um, not for only um, older women, but for young people as well, in that we are uh, promoting this idea that um, they need to take responsibility for where they are in life, what kind of opportunities they have, you know, and um, if you're an older woman and you're living in poverty or you never went for promotion because you, you couldn't find the time uh, to do it, that uh, in fact we're sort of ignoring these structural issues, mm -hmm. you know, that actually structurally within organisations women, as you said, are discriminated against and it, it isn't uh, simply simple enough, that it's not a simple enough solution to say that actually it's your responsibility and you could go and get some training or you could be more assertive or you could, you know, because that's not really how it works and we know that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, for, a short, for a while I was head of department and um, we have men in our department. Any meeting I went along to, and I don't know if you experienced this, but to any meeting I went along to, they would look at the man for the head of department. And, um, you know, where I would work with very good colleagues who used to find this very annoying and say, no, she is the head of department. Mm -hmm. And I think it's yeah. um, something that, you know, no matter what achievements some women have, you know, there is this. Um, as I say to students, there, there's a lot of structural issues, but some of it just comes down to this uh, discrimination that is perhaps not even something that people are aware of. The image of, of certain kinds of activities is never connected to women. So an academic, what do you think of when you think of an academic? Possibly somebody with brown sandals or <laughs> yeah, but certainly somebody with a beard or, you know, who looks like a man. Um, and it's very hard to change our cultural views about our uh, the reason I raise that, that kind of imagery is because I would like young women and young men for that matter, but young women to think, you know, she get older, you'll you'll learn a few things, she get to do all sorts of stuff. 
you've got a much richer kind of life. I'm not suggesting that that, that means young people are, are somehow thin. I just mean that there is that sense of you do learn a whole lot of stuff. And actually, being older is quite a good thing. Mm. And that is never really presented in our culture as, uh, as, as being something to look forward to. So, you know, building on what you're talking about, Chris, and others, um, and that cultural perspective here in, in Australia about older women. And, you know, uh, as someone who has grown up in, in um, an Asian context as well, uh, if we look at other cultures, um, sometimes it's very different. So we, we look at older people, but also older women, um, they're more revered, they're more respected in a family context and in a social context at least. So it is really... Uh, I think it's part of Western culture that we live in that is really dominated by a small group of people who are in control of marketing and what you know our body image uh, should be like. And as women grow older, that becomes less attainable. And that is something that um, we need to get control back of and really kind of say all body images should be um, out there and be respected and uh, it's what your body can do as well. So I think there's a real interesting connection between body image and marketing in this culture and how much control that has over um, our society. And you know, what can we do to really shift that is, is a conversation that I'm really interested in, in having. Whenever we put our minds to government policy in any area, we absolutely need to be aware if we are truly focused on achieving equality and equitable outcomes. We always need to put our minds to how we can amplify the voices of everybody who experiences a particular issue. Because if you are genuinely wanting to hear and act upon people's experiences, people, as you said, who have that intersectionality, well then our policy always must be carefully informed by that range of voices, not just one group that we do a formal consultation with, but rather we always need to look at how we can genuinely amplify the voices of a diverse group of people and really strive to understand their experiences and make sure that that informs any policy. So in all of my portfolios, that is what I always strive to do. I know that is what our government always strives to do, to make sure that we are truly understanding and truly acting upon that diversity of voices. And I think um, that is a really, that is always the right thing to do. It's always the respectful thing to do. It also means that we get much better policy outcomes. And I always say that diversity in decision making makes for better decisions. It is absolutely the case and we should always strive to make sure it is there and it's heard. So building on what the Minister said and also the conversation um, with the Lord Mayor, what we're seeing uh, through the Women's Information Service, which is a shop front uh, of the Office for Women, is a lot more older women coming in and they're experiencing housing and security. So, you know, when we talk yeah. about homelessness, homelessness can take on many forms and uh, rough sleeping is the most visible form of homelessness. Um, but more prominent um, in terms of what we're seeing is women who are sleeping uh, at their children's houses because uh, they, their rentals may have, um, you know, not worked out. Women who are using their friends' houses or little uh, flats out the back of their gardens as accommodation. And it's that insecure housing that we're seeing as becoming mm. more problematic and something that um, we're working on uh, at different levels. So the state government is uh, is establishing a, a task force on older women's housing, uh, and that will be really interesting to see how that progresses. Uh, I'm assuming that that will look at the root causes of um, housing insecurity, but also who we can partner with across the South Australian community to get some solutions in place. Some other programs that I think uh, will be really important for all women, but um, older women as well, 
is um, the agenda that uh, the state government has around addressing domestic violence. Mm -hmm. So if part of that is a legislative agenda and uh, that will be looking at uh, criminalising coercive control. And we've talked about violence against women, violence against older women. Coercive control is uh, it's an insidious form of violence. And what the research tells us is that uh, older women, far from being immune to coercive control, uh, can be more likely to be trapped by relationships yep. Yep. where uh, they have been for many, many years. It's harder to get out of those relationships mm. where where uh, their partner or a member of their family have been, uh, I guess, controlling their finances, their ability to leave the house, a whole bunch of things. Um, so coercive control legislation is on the agenda. Another um, thing that the state government will be introducing will be an equality bill, and that is to promote equality across all um, attributes, including gender, of course, but, you know, we'll be looking at um, how age intersects with that as well. And I think the third thing that's worth talking about in terms of our domestic violence agenda going forward is um, establishing safety hubs that are focused on prevention of violence, but also women who uh, may have left a relationship or have made a decision to leave a relationship and, and what they need, you know, past that crisis element. Um, so establishing safety hubs in the north and the south of Adelaide and in that exploratory stage at the moment, uh, looking for, for different partners and different ideas to make these happen um, and make sure that they are accessible and friendly for, for older women because I think what we find through our work is there's a lot of shame um, of yeah, absolutely. experiencing yeah. violence and how do we... How do we um, get through that and ensure that they know that they're not alone and it's nothing to be ashamed of. CODA is an independent organisation um, and works directly with um, older people. So we're a, an older people's movement effectively. What CODA has been trying to do with the state government, I think getting really good reception from our state government, uh, is to say, Older women, it's important to do upstream things to prevent older women in the future from being disadvantaged, but it is really important to take notice of older people, older women right now. And I think housing is one of the really critical areas that we've got to pay attention to. Um, certainly family, economic and other violence is a really important area of attention. The other one is in terms of supporting older women to get back into the workforce. Um, we know that um, older women's careers often blossom in their 50s and 60s just at the point um, that they're being discriminated against in a cross-section between ageism and sexism. And so it's really important that we stop thinking that all careers peter out in their 60s and start thinking about um, older women as a group of people who have a lot to continue to contribute in terms of our economic life in South Australia um, may well need some support. It's our, our uh, training programs obviously uh, front end training and education, our university and vocational education is front ended. So the other area where I think we've got to put some significant effort into is um, supporting older women, including with uh, lifelong training, training that enables them to make the most of careers that may well come into their own in their 50s, 60s and 70s, uh, uh, rather than 30s and 40s, which is a traditional kind of men's peak time, I suppose. Um, and, and think about uh, life course entirely differently. Stop thinking about a life course as being modelled on the life course of our parents and grandparents, or indeed on um, you know, our, our stereotype of a male career. Start thinking about a life course in terms of the great variety, including for people, uh, women and men, um, who've migrated to Australia in the, in the middle of their employment years. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's time to disrupt the policy settings around employment, around housing, um, indeed around uh, image and um, uh, violence, economic security. I think a, a real issue uh, through COVID has been that, um, particularly in South Australia, we had a lot of community um, organisations and mostly held in town halls, in fact, where, and other community centres across um, South Australia where all older migrants, 
particularly Greeks, uh, were very good at doing this, met once a week or once a fortnight and they um, had a meal together and they uh, had a, a speaker come in to talk about a particular issue. And with COVID, of course, that all disappeared. And I think that's a shame because one of the assumptions that I saw through this process and uh, with my own parents at the time is there's an assumption that people are literate in their own language. And this is not always the case. And of course, the documents that get translated from one language to another are actually quite sophisticated for people who might have had a primary school education, if any education at all. So of course, these Greek documents would come home to second generation migrants whose Greek probably is pretty average too. Uh, and would have preferred it in English, really. Um, but nevertheless, I think um, the communication of important information uh, was quite difficult to relay. There has also been issues with, of course, Greek radio and other um, ways of communicating to, um, um, to particular migrant groups. I know there was one particular Greek radio was discontinued. And I know that uh, my parents relied on that one for information. Uh, so I think it does become difficult. And then once again, the older migrants are relying on their children, you know, for communication of this important information, or they're getting miscommunication and are so fearful, um, you know, uh, of um, something they have no understanding of. Well, there's, a, there's entirely they rely on their children, the goodwill of their children, and um, you know. Um, that there's also an assumption, I think, within the community that um, Greek families are so close-knit that their children are selfless and they're prepared to, to put in their time, and I should say that for any other community, there is an assumption because, of course, we don't have the resources to support uh, these, uh, the, these older people. And even, I must say, there are some Greek nursing homes, but um, the second-generation migrants aren't working at these nursing homes. In fact, you know, they're particularly educated and, you know, it's new, the new generation of migrants that tend to work in those sorts of low-level paid jobs. So there's not even Greek-speaking people in Greek nursing homes. There are some, but they're not available all the time. So I think, um, I mean, of course, it's good that they're there, but they're not resourced uh, in, in the way that... And that's part of, I think, as Australia and um, our generations continue, that language is lost. But I think for the older, particularly women, um, I think it's a very isolating uh, process for them. Particularly, as I said, the second generation, some uh, second generation Greeks have very good at Greek, some don't have uh, Greek at all. So not having any form of community, even church became quite restricted um, and their access to church, you know, was, is, a, is a real issue in terms of connecting and rely on their children whom they can't communicate very well with mm -hmm. and probably don't want to talk about the issues that affect them. Just in response to what Jane commented, um, we really have uh, to look at two speeds, the women that are older now and that need immediate care, but it's also how we teach, particularly financial literacy, to the younger generation coming through. I know even in my office, the young ones, I said, put an extra $100 a week in your super, do it now, you know, while they have the ability to do that. So that financial independence um, is really important and that's gonna see that generation through. And the other thing I wanted to respond to was, was my lived experience, my 30s and 40s were all about my children and so I was sort of, I did have a career but I was juggling career and kids uh, where my husband didn't have to do that so he, that's the period of time, 30s and 40s, that his career took off and then again towards my late 40s and into my 50s that's when my career took off because my kids were suddenly, mm -hmm. you know, finish school and things like that. And um, so it's a really interesting sort of dynamic, uh, which if you understood that's what it was going to be, you would say, okay, well, you've got that 10 years or and I'm gonna have that decade or whatever. And you would, as a family, you'd sort of work through that if you can't do the juggle with both of you at the same time. So I'm sort of, I'm really interested in that, but it's also bringing women back to the workforce. The other comment I just wanted to make was around COVID. Now, what COVID has done over the last couple of years in Adelaide, but more so around Australia, is the work from home. And uh, I uh, saw a great um, 
a thought provoker from Julia Gillard actually that said that because work from home is staying, it's mainly the women that are opting to work from home. And so they can drop the kids, they work, they can pick up the kids, they do the washing, whatever, and then they'll work at night to finish their day's work. Um, and as a consequence, that generation will become invisible and that generation will miss out on promotion because they are not in the office in the face of those that are looking to promote. And as a, a, again, as a consequence, there is the potential that in five years or 10 years time, we are going to go back to what it was like um, several decades ago, where all of the top levels of management are going to be male because they're the ones that have actually been brought through and the, the, this generation will be affected in their careers uh, by actually opting for for a, a, a sort of hybrid model in terms of work. And I'm really keeping an eye on that, even in my own office, um, to see who's opting to work from home and who's not, and it's primarily the women. And I'd like to add to that to say that um, with women working from home, I have seen in, in, um, around my office and in our department that in fact those women are complaining that because they are at home, they're actually doing more of the housework than they ever did before because men are leaving to go to work. So we're reproducing a model that we, we fought. In the 50s? Yeah. yeah, I know. Yeah, it does feel like that. Yeah, so because you're home, you're going to cook the dinner, you're going to pick up the kids from school, um, and then you're going to work all night Yeah. to do the, the essentials to keep your job and, yeah. to, and to have an income. Yeah, I think that's, um, that's an unfortunate consequence of this flexibility. And we know that the women are much more likely to be the carers. Women are much more likely to care for longer, care more intensively and care more often for people through their lifetimes. Um, and including as they get older, often for older parents, increasingly for grandchildren. The census has just told us that 67% of grandparent carers are actually women. So the, the caring responsibility is something that follows us throughout our lives. Sometimes our solutions to things like uh, shortages in aged care or uh, you know, people's low expectations, I think, of aged care are to look for informal carers. And again, women are implicated in that. Um, and it means that, again, women whose careers might be starting to blossom in their 50s and 60s uh, are actually compromised because they're being called in to uh, care for grandchildren or indeed for older parents. And, uh, you know, I think a huge part of this is being very conscious of those pressures on women as they age. Well, that's valued because maybe it's as simple as superannuation has to be a shared superannuation mm. um, if there's, you know, a, a a breadwinner in the household, be it male or female, that that is a shared superannuation situation or something that, um, so it's really having a look at those old models um, and seeing if there's things that we can do around that. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we should be value, valuing that caring. That, that, that it's a care economy. It, it absolutely economy, is, yeah. Absolutely. And we can't do without it. So therefore, how do we value it? Because I teach uh, in gender studies, and I teach a lot of young women predominantly, they take our courses. And one thing that they don't recognise is this issue. They seem to think because they're raised um, feeling very equal, having every opportunity, um, you know, being looked after, being provided for, they think that somehow these problems are problems of our generation yeah. rather than into the future. They see themselves because they're not <laughs> yet there yet. And in fact, I have students who, who many, many years later I see after they've had children say, okay, there's a problem. How do we get into young people's minds? And um, even young men, young men who say, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to leave my wife home to, I want to be part of my children's growing up and then enter the workforce, a workforce that is structured in such a way that actually, you know, they, they're relied on to be at work. And men who take, you know, the right, uh, what is it, the right... Um, um, paternity. Not only paternity to leave, there's the right to request. So men who ask for the right to request to leave early to pick up uh, children from school are then seen to be not are not serious about their careers. Yeah. Like women. Yeah. And men like women, that's right. And then men are less likely to do that. And then they get into this, men do more overtime than women. So once again, it reproduces this idea. And as with young women, I tell young women that uh, when the time comes to stay at home with children, you might think now that that could be your partner. But actually, he's going to be earning more than you are. 
he's going to be on some career track for promotion. It doesn't make sense for you just for him to stay home because the your economics in your family would be compromised. So we have a structural, a real structural problem. I want to add a little bit of a caveat there, though, because one of the things that I guess I would say, is, uh, at least on the, on the interview material on younger women, uh, is that a lot of women are noticing that that might happen to them and are deciding as a result, if they're in a heterosexual relationship, uh, deciding that they will not have children. Yes, that's right. Um, so I, I think there are consequences of all sorts. None of, none of them are necessarily great. We would. Yeah, we would like, uh, however we do have children, um, I guess we would like that everyone would feel they could if they wanted to, and that also they wouldn't have any trouble if they didn't. So yeah, that's the other thing about shared super. I'm a bit nervous about shared super because it assumes you're in a relationship, which you may not be. Uh, and I think relationships now are much more unsteady uh, for older women, certainly, because they're often uh, not going to continue in relationships for 40, 50, 60 years anymore. Um, and, of course, young people are not necessarily going to do that either. So things are moving. But oddly enough, as we've just described, I think, very well, there are some things that remain so static. And you think, how is it possible that you, you can have all these new changes that really are affecting all of us, young and old, men and women, that it's still, there There are these structures that, and I think Pam's point is a really important one, is structures which restrain despite those changes in society. Women in any sort of public arena, politics included, are often judged by our appearance. And I was reflecting a couple of years ago with one of my very, very close women colleagues about what happens when core flutes, when the, the posters go up and the rise that you get on social media and other places about how you look. And one of the things that my friend and I were reflecting that you actually, in that awful world of judgment about your appearance, you can't actually win because one group of people will think um, you're too pretty and so therefore you must be, you know, not so bright, or that, you know, you don't look very good and what on earth are you doing here? And so we were just talking about how noth nothing is actually right in terms of how you look, because it's all just judgment and it's actually all just nonsense. So I think there is this thing of just um, uh, finding that way to be absolutely comfortable and confident and to really speak out against that utter, utter nonsense. We need more women in parliament. We need more women in public life. And that is because we make better decisions as a parliament when we have a diverse group of women, in fact, a diverse group of people there in our parliament. And I just wanted to finish by saying that um, in South Australia, in, on the government benches, Labor now has 14 out of 27 of our parliamentarians in the House of Assembly are women. And I have been talking about diversity and decision making in every aspect of life forever. I've been saying it always, but I can't quite put into words the feeling that came on that first day of Parliament when we finally had achieved equality. It still gives me shivers when I think about it. It felt different. And in terms of changing culture in one of those old type of systems, um, you, you can just cannot underestimate how important it is to have a diverse group of women, diverse group of people at that table to make those decisions. A uh, deeply feminist at heart, um, which I got from my father, not from my mother, which was really interesting in terms of um, his focus on education and you could do anything you wanted to if you put your mind to it. And uh, he was, he, it, it didn't matter that I was, you know, male or female, it was the same. Um, and so, uh, you know, I just think that uh, what I'd love to see is more women uh, in politics. Um, it's great the number of women that have come through in the last two elections. We're about to go to a local government election. Um, 
at the last election there were 20, in South Australia, 23 out of 68 councils had female mayors, which was the highest number ever, and they celebrated. Um, uh, the advertiser did a big feature. The journalist said to me, oh, you know, so what do you think? And I said, do you really want to know? And he said, yeah. And I said, I, I would like to think that this isn't news, you know, in, in a few years' time. I'd like to think that this is just not worth covering. It's just there's as many women in uh, these positions as there are men. Um, I do want there to be younger voices in local government, and which is hard with all of the pressures that we've just talked about, but to try and get younger women to have a voice um, for the future of their cities uh, is really important. Um, but equally, you know, the, the older woman's voice needs to be heard. I mean, uh, you know, um, I'm the only third female Lord Mayor in the history of the City of Adelaide. Um, our, our governor is the only third female governor in the history of Adelaide. Um, so it's not the norm and I'd love it to just be something we don't even have to be talking about. And look, I, I fully agree. And, um, and in that way, we want the issue to be invisible, don't we? Not women, but we want issues to just um, disappear in a way. Um, I, I think that, you know, this, this passion, we saw the Me Too, Too movement rise last year and it manifested um, for a bunch of reasons. And what I think is also really interesting about the why that came out as it did is, you know, we also have more women um, behind cameras in the media, um, you know, um, actually running the show a little bit. And so I think part of that was, uh, like women have always been there and they'll continue to be there, but as we have women in these different roles, uh, we'll get more attention for this as well. So it's about women in leadership mm -hmm. and women um, in leadership in all different sectors, in all different careers, yes. because as we become more out there, we will shine the spotlight on, on um, issues that affect us, young, old, black, white, you know, country, city. Um, so I think that's been a really important, um, it's just been very important in, in making this all more visible, I think. Um, and the other thing which, which I've been reflecting on through this project and, um, and through my work more generally is that whole concept of visibility and, and can it actually be a power? Can it be like a superpower? Can we have, you know, as we get older, our invisible cloak that actually allows us the freedom to just actually do our do our thing without the scrutiny that, you know, I feel I felt a lot more as a younger woman um, in various ways and, and getting older, I don't feel that anymore. I don't feel that pressure. I just feel the invisibility is actually something that I can work with. Um, not saying that, you know, we want us to be invisible, we want us to be recognised, but also just thinking about invisibility a bit as a superpower. I don't think you're invisible at all. I just think that you are confident in who you are and what you're doing. Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's the confidence, it's it's not invisible. Well, we don't want to, want to be invisible, but I'm just saying, how do we actually turn that to something that we can actually, you know, build on and, and make us even more powerful? We know all of the evidence from McKinsey and from Harvard management is that diversity adds value. It adds value to bottom lines. It adds value to the integrity of government. It, and, and so not just gender diversity, but all diversity. Um, and, and the second thing I'd say is we don't get there by accident or by doing what we do, you know, doing tomorrow what we did yesterday. It, it has to be deliberate. We have to disrupt. Um, otherwise, we sleepwalk towards a future which looks a lot like where we've been. Uh, been. And, I, you know, it, it, it's a tough gig for older women, I think, at the moment to say, to buck back at those trends and to buck back at the, at the lookism, I think, that holds us back. But it is really important that... We support one another to do that, that we rejoice, I think, in, you know, 27 mayors last time uh, in a parliament which is gradually looking uh, browner, looking, you know, more gender diverse. Uh, it's got representations now from many more uh, people from LGBTI backgrounds. So I think our opportunity is to build on that, but I think we should resist the temptation 
to think that that momentum will take us there on its own. That has to be, a, you know, deliberately putting pictures up in our chambers of women, uh, making sure that the, we're not invisible, shouting loud and supporting one another to shout loud. Yes, I do think we see changes in relationships and uh, so far as I have the research background to talk about that, I would say that one of the things, and I guess it relates to a more general point, I hope you don't mind me moving to a more general point, but uh, one of the things that's, that troubles me is if with the best will in the world, many of the programs we talk about that might assist older people and older women specifically, is the tendency to see older women as kind of put upon, you know, as, and I'm, I'm not suggesting we are not, um, and I, I, I guess I would certainly say, you know, in my own life, uh, that endless amounts of sexual harassment have been there forever, you know, and I'm, I'm sure that every woman in this room has experienced sexual violence in, or sexual harassment in some version or another, at some stage in their life, it's, it's just ubiquitous. And certainly was in, in my uh, younger years, but even more recently. But anyway, the point I suppose is that while on the one hand we have evidence of things remaining remarkably the same in you know, very disconcerting ways, at the same time, uh, I would say that there are differences. I would say that older women are uh, much more um, capable of expressing what they would like, what they would prefer than they used to. And I think of my, when I think to my grandma, you know, we can all think to our grandmas, there is no question that there is change in relationships. I'm not suggesting it's all gorgeous, but I am saying it's changed. And in many ways, the number of opportunities in relationships to make choices for older women, younger women as well, but older women to say what they think they really need we see that, I hate to say this, this, is not such a positive thing in a way, but leaving relationships. Uh, older women are more inclined to say, I've had enough, than older men. Um, and then, you know, we can say that that doesn't mean that uh, we all, all couldn't learn to do relationships in a better way. But I, I guess I would say that women are becoming more able to say, we have examples. The very thing about visibility, about uh, seeing ourselves out there, and, and actually seeing what young women are, are speaking up against too. It is an encouragement to older women as well. The whole point, I suppose, of all the things we've been talking about is to see uh, women and, and older women as a resource in the world, as a, in a positive way, not simply in the legalistic... Uh, there are limits to what government in our culture uh, can do it or in, in its programs because those programs are generally reactive. Mm. That is what they're meant to do. You're not supposed to interfere with people too much unless something goes wrong. So there's a reactive element in law, in government. There's not a proactive one where you say, how could we reshape society so that people who are presently judged to be sort of of no significance are all regarded as of a significance. The difficulty for governments, agencies, um, academics, teachers, all sorts of people is to say, how would you reimagine World. Not just how do we stop nasty things. Mm. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that, but I think that tendency to not try to reimagine what we want mm. is a problem in itself. And I think including for a fast growing household type, which is the older single woman, um, she is increasingly who we see in our suburbs and our cities um, and we don't have settings often, we don't have housing, we don't have um, an economic structure that supports her to flourish and thrive. I mean, I can't talk about all cold women uh, because I, I don't know and I don't want to generalise, but I would say that um, for um, Greek older women, um, so Greeks in South Australia and I think in Australia, you know, have high levels of house ownership compared to, to post-war Greek migrants, uh, compared to most migrant groups. So housing doesn't seem to be as big an issue, although um, with the death of one uh, partner, um, generally they live in areas that are now very expensive and the rates and, and, and electricity and housing costs are quite expensive. So I think that's, that's an, an issue for them. From what I saw, Generally, they seem to be more accepting of their lot. They seem to lead 
these issues to their children. Uh, even in terms of deciding about end-of-life issues, they're quite happy to allow their children to make these decisions. They defer to their children, probably in ways that I would expect other groups might not. Um, but I, as I say, maybe some Southeast Asian groups are the same, but certainly amongst the Greeks, they're very, um, even in, if they're in awful relationships, they tend to put up with them, thinking that that's what you do. And certainly there was a feel that after so many years of being together and all the hardships of migration and raising children in you know, foreign land and all so on, that um, you know, they got to the end of it. So there's no point now in doing anything. You might as well just put up with it to, to the end. Um, um, and I guess there was also the issue of perhaps with some of those relationships, they weren't love matches to begin with. So you went into these relationships with certain kind of understanding and expectations that aren't the same as perhaps young people today in Australia or other groups about what uh, is required of a late relationship. But I would say though that while I think older Greek women are not vocal in their community because there's some cultural issues around women being vocal and that's to do with sexism, um, within their families they are very vocal and often quite dominant and often the people that make the decisions within the family unit. But when it comes to uh, the face of the community, they defer. But I actually think that's a, a related to a, a very much larger point, but it, one that we've kind of touched on. Um, if you're watching the TV news, as most of us usually do, the number of times where there's some moment in, in society like you know the Syrian refugees or the Arab Spring or the Ukraine or whatever, what do we see? We see fields of men. Mm. There are hardly any women. It's as if women are not changing the world and not shaping things because they have that lack of public voice. Every time we look on, on a TV program and watch something, have a look how many women are there. You know, it seems to me that that's such a big issue. Certainly, that the, the women who are there are um, not so many older women, and it's a, an issue that is well beyond this particular culture. Just to reflect in in two different ways, a lot of um, people often ask me, you know, why I went into politics. Sometimes people say, "Why on earth would you would you go into politics?" And the answer for me is always the same. I always reflect back on my early childhood years of growing up in a family where things were very difficult. There was a lot of domestic violence and alcoholism. And I definitely learned from a very, very, very early age through experience, you know, through being very, very poor, that there isn't some neat distribution of means and resources, but in fact, quite the opposite. And I developed what I call my burning passion for fairness. Um, I got taught by my very, very strong and very loud mum that no matter what was happening for us to always look upwards and outwards into the community and to be very active in the community. And my brother and my two sisters and I were very active in our community in different ways, whether that was through surf life saving, drama, sport, music, community groups, whatever it might be. And I learned that by being active in a community that you find wonderful community leaders, sometimes in the least likely places, who really include you as part of a community family and give you help to give you that sense of belonging. And I also found that by working together as a community, that is how we get things done and how we make change that includes people and make sure people are all treated fairly. I also got taught by my very strong mum during those um, quite difficult times to find your voice and to speak up on that which was unfair, even when your voice was shaky and it was hard to do so. And I think, I think about that a lot. And I think we as leaders always need to focus not just on finding our own voice, but also on how we empower other people's voices. And so I say that for two reasons. One, just to reflect back on the comment I made about that diversity of voices always making for better decisions. But also to say that when I was younger, I did experience that 
um, I guess, self-doubt or not being quite sure of how to, you know, that I fit and that I could say things or, and often felt quite awkward and like I didn't quite belong for a range of, of reasons about things that were happening um, in my life. And I, I think about that a lot in terms of the work that I do now. Um, and I think about how difficult it is for a whole group of people. Um, and I reflect particularly on women and their journey to find their voice. And in a world sometimes where, um, you know, in the political world, you are often expected to be immediately confident and able to articulate what you want to say and to be able to, to you know, shake things off to some degree. I often reflect that it is really important that we empower more women to become involved in the political world, not to feel like, why on earth would you ever do that? And to have confidence in their own voice and absolutely for them to know that what they say, what they feel matters, that they matter and that they absolutely have a place there. It's a journey certainly that I went on. It's one and particularly in the context of thinking about older women and how their voices may or may not be valued, that it's incredibly important um, that we first of all understand that that journey to having confidence in your own voice can be difficult, but that we as leaders empower those voices and support them and nurture people to speak up and out about what is important. I was very lucky. I grew up in a very loving family. We, weren't, we didn't have a lot of money or anything like that, but um, certainly I never felt that I went without. Um, and uh, it, there was a, a very much a feeling, because I come from a migrant family, so I, I was the first one born in Australia in my family, um, that, you know, you work hard, you put in the effort, and you will have a good life. And um, Australia is an amazing country, and Adelaide is an amazing city. And I constantly, constantly see nothing but opportunity. And I think that uh, it's a bit, it's limitless as to what you can do if you put your mind to it and your energy behind it. And I've always been really passionate in that way and been, I guess, shepherded along to try new things, to take on challenges, to look at opportunities, to look at where the gaps are, to see what, we, what you can put in place and to take people with you. Um, and so it, it's one of those things. I didn't wake up any day in my life and go, I'm gonna be Lord Mayor one day. That was not in my thinking at all. And um, as, as, as some of you know, you know, I mean, I've had many different careers and, and, uh, um, and my passion has always been the arts because I think the arts has a way of expressing things to so many people in, in such a creative and collaborative way. So uh, it is one of those where I, I really want to encourage more women to have a voice. I think women need to know that their voice is heard. And um, as the minister said, you know, women are being heard. Women are using their vote, they're using their voice, they're using their pen, they're using, they're using all manner of things to actually be heard and say that, you know, your voice is just as important as anybody else's. And it doesn't matter whether you're young, old, male, female, it doesn't actually matter. You all have a voice and I encourage everybody to use it. I grew up uh, as a migrant to Australia and like you were saying, Lord Mayor, um, I feel so lucky to, to be in this country and, and this state. The opportunity that, has, um, that I've experienced, I feel really privileged. Uh, but I think what drives me to be really, uh, I guess, candid is I want to see more women around tables, but I also want to see more women of colour, uh, more mm. women of age, more women of colour around tables. I'm often in a lot of meetings, a lot of forums, and I'm not the only brown face around that table. And, um, you know, I, I feel like I am financially, economically privileged, but um, I think that's something that really drives me. And when I say women of colour, I mean also a real focus on Aboriginal women and older, older women of colour of different backgrounds, because 
I think when we start talking about, you know, different characteristics, we, we oh, women of colour, you know, it's just kind of one strand, but women with disability, women, um, younger women, older women, LGBTIQ. So making sure that when we are talking about that lens, that we're also um, adding another layer of diversity. And, and again, um, diversity around those decision-making tables generates a much richer society economically, civically, socially. So I think that's what drives me. Well, I'm a migrant to Australia too. We migrated here in the 1970s. So um, my parents had four children and we had one born here as well. So there's five of us. Um, I actually grew up quite poor in a uh, relative. Uh, my father was a very charismatic man, but uh, certainly wasn't a provider. And it was my mother that um, held the family together and was a very strong woman. She was illiterate, but um, she um, had hopes for us that we certainly didn't live that life. Uh, having said that, through circumstance, so I didn't end up going to university until I was quite later in my life. Um, and I think what, what took me to the university, as opposed to doing any other kind of work, was the belief in education, which is why I'm there. And I think, as do many of us that are in the university, that education is quite liberating and education offers opportunities. And this is what I try to impress upon my students and we support first at university uh, migrants and Aboriginal students to be very supportive of through mentoring and other programs. Because um, one of the things I'd like to say to young people is that it's never too late to go back to university because I think it is a, a, it can change your life and it certainly changed mine. And why women's studies, uh, which is where my, I ended up um, in our gender studies and um, at the centre, is because watching uh, my family's processes, watching my father who contributed uh, very little and in fact caused issues, uh, be the community leader, be uh, very well respected within the community where in our household he was dreadful and um, and it was us women um, my brothers mm -hmm. too needed a lot of support it's us women that, that drove everything and I saw that in the community but actually under the scenes it was women and yet none of them spoke out none of them had the visibility you know and I um, and I really wanted not to be that kind of woman and not to and to encourage women that I knew my group women and other women to um, don't stand behind your man you know actually you know stand alongside yeah yeah, yeah. and if they're not sufficient in front of it's <laughs> fine <laughs> you know? so i feel as though i have been surrounded by strong women all my life my granny my mother my sisters um, I'm the mother of four kids, uh, one of whom is a, a young woman who is incredibly strong and clear about her future and her grip on the world, but so are my sons. And, so, and, and I think as part of that, you know, we've always been part of a, a conversation which is um, that the world, we need to do better in the world, we need to bring others with us, um, that we are part of a community, and, and that we, you know, that, that, that our emphasis and our uh, should be less on ourselves and meeting our own needs, and much more on taking others with us and being part of a, a community. That that's where our nourishment comes from, that's where our uh, enjoyment comes from. Um, so really important to strive individually, but very much be part of our community and be nourished and to nourish our community. I'm sure. I mean, nobody knows exactly why they end up doing what they're doing, so I uh, don't want to sound too sure, but uh, I would say that the most obvious reason why I might have been driven to think, what is it that we can offer uh, in a university to women, hmm. uh, which seemed to me to be fairly important <laughs> to do, um, is that I was brought up, like many of my generation, uh, in a... Uh, I changed class positions over my lifetime from the working class background and being the first in my family, as many um, of us probably here are, um, to go to university. But also I was brought up in the bush for most of my, almost all my childhood in, uh, in remote communities. And um, I would say that I, unlike some of the statements about community, I would say I was not supported in my community and I doubt that 
that very many women were. Uh, I would say that my uh, uh, little family, my mum and dad, we travelled across the landscape, did not have that view, but they were eccentric in some ways. And they said, not, not so much you could do anything, not at all. They had never said anything like that. <laughs> they were thinking maybe teacher or nurse if you're lucky, you know. <laughs> yeah. And I would have been very pleased with either of those two things too. Uh, but it was a very limited set of possibilities. But it was that thing that, you know, I had before me, my mum and dad just having a very different set of values mm. from the community around me. I didn't feel like I was taking the community anywhere, I can tell you. But it was that sense of, uh, you know, I think it's really important to, as, as Pam was saying, to be able to learn to articulate your position uh, and uh, universities can help with that. They're not the only place, but they're certainly one of them. And the big thing, you know, like all of my generation probably, I'm not sure it's so true now, but at, at my, during my life, education. It was a way of, mm. uh, of poverty, uh, certainly, and also a way of saying, look, I'm allowed to speak. I have a certificate, I can speak, uh, you know, and that really did give me, a, there are different things for other people, of course, but from my background and my time of life, um, I would say I'm classic, you know, uh, came out of uh, education was the way to have a chance to speak and certainly ag against my community, not within my community at all. However, I do agree that uh, bringing the community is essential. Thank you.